Lymphangiomas, hemangiomas, very similar in appearance. These are very large, soft, collapsible, painless masses in the neck and face. They occur uh, because of lack of communication of the lymphatic vesicle to the venous system. So the lymphatic system backs up, and these lesions, they appear very lacculated, cystic-looking um, lesions. They extend from one space of the uh, uh, neck into the other space. They follow the lymphatic system, so they are not localized to a specific cavity uh, or a space in, in the soft tissues of the neck. Most common location of these is in the head and neck area, and the second most common is in the region of the axilla. And the reason for frequency of these in these locations is obviously because there is significantly more lymphatic tissue in, this, in these areas. Treatment surgery, if it's possible, if it's a small. Obviously, you can see they can completely involve the tissues, deformity and swelling, all lymphatic tissue here. On MR, they have a mixed signal. Some, sometimes they may have a small amount of hemorrhage within them, even though that they are actually an avascular lesions. Uh, and also you can see that they can definitely, because of the actual the weight and volume that they have, they can cause bony deformity. This is another case of lymphangioma in the nasopharynx with some enhancement. This is much more focal, so probably surgically would be significantly easier to remove than the other uh, previous case. Tormal cysts, it's a remnant of the notochord. It's an incidental finding. Uh, very bright, untituated images in the midline, in the posterior na uh, nasopharynx, and uh, it would have no real clinical significance, but you just need to know what that is. Uh, it may cause halitosis, and sometimes it may expand and become large and affect the uh, longus collie muscle. In that case, the surgical intervention may be necessary. Infection, uh, we don't really do studies to evaluate to diagnose infection. We are doing the CT study or MR studies to evaluate the complications of infection, formation of abscess, evaluation of the airway, um, and um, presence of necrotic nodes, and the spread of specifically in pediatric age group, spread of infection to the retropharyngeal space, and compromise of airway. This is a patient with long history, several weeks of uh, pharyngitis, with heavy doses of antibiotic with no response, showing a small cystic lesion in a very significantly enlarged uh, tonsil with a peritonsillar abscess. And sometimes these abscesses may actually uh, develop, in, in, this, in this case, a necrotic node. How do we differentiate this from a squamous cell carcinoma? Without history, they look very, very similar. There are very few hints that can help you without the history to make a diagnosis, and that's like in this case with a very large uh, necrotic node. But if you look at this, the sternocleidomastoid muscle on this side is severely thickened, so it has inv invaded the muscle and it causes myositis, so patients may present with trismus and muscle contraction. Uh, squamous cell carcinomas usually do not do this. The fascial planes often are preserved. And also, if you look at it in the submental region, the fat is all strandy, and that usually indicates uh, presence of inflammation. When infection spreads to the retropharyngeal nodes, when the node becomes necrotic and it breaks, now it's in a space of almost no restriction. It's in the retropharyngeal space, and these fascial planes can be easily dissected. These lesions, these abscesses can extend from base of the skull all the way to the mediastinum. And in the pre-antibiotic, these were called Ludwig angina. Patients may present with chest pain. Obviously now with uh, antibiotic resistance infections and also auto, um, immune diseases and all that, this infection, uh, this retropharyngeal abscesses and extensive involvement of the uh, retropharyngeal space is becoming more common. Parapharyngeal space immediately lateral to the uh, uh, nasopharynx. It's a fat-filled space. There are very small amount of structure in there, some vasculature, and some um, maybe minor salivary glands. Uh, pathology of the uh, parapharyngeal space is usually infection, and uh, we don't really go to that. It's most of the cases that we showed up to this point, they had parapharyngeal involvement to them. We talk about carotid space. It's a very tiny little sliver 
of a space, one of those cylinders that uh, Dr. Nayak talked about. It contains the uh, carotid artery and cranial nerves 9, 10, and 12, and extends from the skull base all the way to the, uh, to the, uh, the thoracic inlet. And the lesions of the uh, carotid space, they either arise from the vasculature or from the neural tissue that is in the carotid space. So the pathology of it, we show you some paraganglioma and schwannomas. Again, this is at the skull base, immediately anterior to the bone, to the C1. You see a very large enhancing mass further down, very well localized to this region. And you can definitely tell that this is within the carotid space because it's almost against the bone. And the pathologies here are very limited. On MR, you can see this elongated mass right along the anterior aspect of the spine, typical appearance of a schwannoma. This is a case of squamous cell carcinoma with bilateral metastatic disease nodes into the carotid space and retropharyngeal space. So this is lymphatic nodes. Of other pathologies of the, uh, retro, uh, of the carotid space are paragangliomas. Paragangliomas, they occur in different places in the head and neck area. The most common four locations of it are a middle ear cavity, that would be the glomus tympanicum. Uh, they can happen in the jugular fossa, that's glomus uh, jugulari, and along the vagus nerve and the carotid body tumor. This tumor is very well demarcated, enhancing mass in the carotid space, a chemodactoma. Location is very typical. It has significant amount of vascularity in it, and in, uh, this has been described as, sal as salt and pepper appearance. I don't know if the mixture is not even, so maybe a little bit more pepper than salt there, and they do enhance very intensely. Not very many tumors in the head and neck cancers, they enhance as intensely as chemodactoma does, so it's, that would be helpful, and also location of it, obviously. We talk about masticator space. Masticator space extends from below the mandible and extends superiorly to the insertion of the uh, temporalis muscle to the calvarium. It contains the musculature, if you look at it here. Most all of the mas masticator muscles are in there, and of course includes the mandible. The um, cranial nerve V3 is also in this uh, territory. Pathologies of the masticator space are primarily infection, odontogenic um, origin, and tumors are usually metastatic lesions, primarily from kidney, lung, and breast. You can have, patient have, can have multiple myeloma or osseous lesions or lymphoma. This is a patient with breast cancer with very large destructive mass involving the mandible. Localization is very easy. Obviously, any lesions of the mandible is in the masticator space. They can extend tumors from this location, can actually stay within the fascial planes of the masticator space and extend superiorly, as it is in this case. And you can see this, this tumor involving the mandible and extends superiorly. This tumor basically reached into the infratemporalis fossa all the way to the temporal bone. Uh, we talk very briefly about the uh, uh, bronchial cleft cysts. This is a very common finding. Um, it's a, there are three types. Uh, the type one is from the second bro bro brachial cleft apparatus. It happens, its location is behind the submandibular gland, at the angle of the mandible, and would project anterior to the anterior edge of the sternocleidomastoid muscle. These lesions have lymphatic tissue in their wall. They are usually diagnosed between the ages of 20 and 40, and is often diagnosed after an upper respiratory tract infection. And what happens with that, the inflammation of the lymphatic system in the wall of the cyst can make them swell and become more pronounced or maybe painful. In that case, they become actually, they do enhance, and they can have septation in them that is definitely a, uh, a scar of infection. And obviously, these can be surgically resected. The type 
One arises from the, uh, the first branchial cleft, and it can happen at the level of the parotid gland or external auditory canal. Tell us about this first case that you see. Okay, so I'm given two non-contrast CT scans through the... Uh, Brilliant. Two non-contrast CT scans. So he has identified not only the study, but the plane of imaging. Who could ask for anything more? Through the level of the, uh, the maxillary sinuses, and there is opacification of the right maxillary sinus. There is... Uh, Aha, now we have to back up over here. This is the left maxillary sinus on this side, correct? Yes. And now the left maxillary sinus has an unerupted tooth within it, correct? Yes. So that looks like Batman over there. They both do, actually. They both look like Batman. Yes. So then this is the maxillary sinus, which is not really opacified. It's not quite pneumatized because it's a little kid. Yes. So let's think about where this is. What is this structure here? Uh, I think that's a uh, Haller cell. A Haller cell. Nice, but it's not. It's, it's more anterior. It's got to do with the nose, and Na it's got to do with tearing. It's the nasolacrimal duct. And as your neighbor has correctly pointed out, it's the nasolacrimal duct. So remember, if you've got the nasolacrimal duct, you are associated with what? The nasal vestibule. So this has got to be the nasal mucosa and the nasal vestibule. And this nasal vestibule has anterior, middle, and posterior compartments leading to the nasopharynx. This is the midline osteocartilaginous thing dividing the two nasal vestibules. So what might this be? So it's the other side. It's Brilliant. The other. It's the other nasal vestibule. However, it only has an anterior and middle compartment because the posterior compartment of the nasal vestibule is atelectatic or it's occluded or it's atretic or it's called... As your neighbor clearly points out, it's called coenal atresia. How lovely it would be to have your neighbor with you in Louisville. <laughs> so now let's go to the neighbor, and this time we don't, we don't help him. Okay, now, now neighbor's going to talk, and nobody's really going to help him. You see, he clearly knows everything. <laughs> okay, no pressure, but, but neighbor, what are these things here? The, the first is a uh, sagittal T2 weighted MR. Excellent. He's identified mm -hmm. it sagittal because he can see the nose and the occipital protuberance. He's identified it as being T2 weighted because not only is the fat bright, so it's a fast spin echo, echo train image, but the CSF is bright, so you know it's a water weighted image. You can see the gray and white matter are quite the same, so it's not an intermediate image. It's not a diffusion-weighted image because you don't see focal field distortion. So by default, it's a long TR, fast spin echo, echo train image. Brilliant. What do you see? Uh, in the uh, nasal pharynx in the midline, there is a mass. It's a uh, low signal. It's about iso-intense to brain parenchyma. And uh, it's ca caused obliteration of the visualized nasal pharynx. Um, is that a PD weighted image, or is that a T maybe a T two or T one weighted image? Uh, Let, the mass is. Let's think about it. Do you think this is a PD? What, what does PD mean? Proton density. Ah, weighted proton image. density, where you see gray and white are slightly differentiated as compared to the T two weighted image. Yes, right. it is. In addition to this, remember, it is blocking off the entrances for the eustachian tubes and is causing mastoid effusion. So this is a functional as well as structural obstruction. And you can see the mass again over here, slightly asymmetric. And if I tell you this person is 22 years old, you can tell me that these subarachnoid spaces are rather prominent. There's, there's a little bit too much water in here. So you've got parenchymal volume loss and a posterior nasopharyngeal heterogeneous mass lesion that is causing functional and structural obstruction to the eustachian tube outlets. What would your differential be? Well, it's kind of young for a, a squamous cell carcinoma. I guess a lymphoma could present in that area. I'm not sure why the atrophy would be tied in. Excellent. The, um, so you know that there's volume loss, and you know that this could be lymphoma, but you're trying very hard to tie them both up. Well, what HIV, could, HIV would could do this. If you're risk immune of suppressed, lymphoma. you can get HIV encephalopathy as well as HIV related lymphoma. Terrific. Who's next? 
Now, we can't have them going back and forth the whole afternoon. There's more restaurants, but they've all disappeared. I'm ready. Oh, she's ready. Go ahead. I'm not ready, but... <laughs> um, we have a uh, sagittal uh, T1-weighted Excellent. Uh, MRI with a huge uh, mass lesion. Um, maybe what does it look like? It is uh, heterogeneous. There's what, what vegetable does it look like? <laughs> Cauliflower. Like a cauliflower. I was thinking fungus, but cauliflower is so much nicer. <laughs> a cauliflower salad instead of a fungus salad. So cauliflower shaped. Okay. And this is with contrast because we can see nasal mucosa is lighting up. And um, Where is this? Where is this mass exactly? Or approximately? My guess is the epicenter is in the... Ah, the epicenter. Don't use those words for Californians. We're terrified of epicenters. <laughs> It's a geological term. We can say it's apparent center is somewhere. Is in the nasal pharynx or in the nasal structure somewhere? The I nasal know. structure somewhere or the nasal pharynx. The nice, vague, but nice. <laughs> uh, this would be, what bone would that be? The clivus. The clivus, that's C0. And this would be the rostrum of the sphenoid bone. Uh -huh. So anterior to that in this location, which would be the ethmoidal labyrinth and the ethmoidal bones. And here we see the epidural space and the vertical plate for the frontal bone. So here we have a, a thin plate of bone that is perforated, very crib reform-like. Oh, the, eth are you, the uh, crib reform plate. The crib reform plate, brilliant. <laughs> and through the crib reform plate are several highly specialized nervous structures which have to do with flavor and taste, smelling, smelling the, the, uh, the olfactory um, bulb olfactory. and gyrus rectus region, which is probably where the apparent center is. Once things become so large and, and look like garden vegetables, it's very hard to tell where they arose from, but probably over here because this has more mass, this has more vascularity. So what is your differential for an anterior cranial fossa process that violates the epidural space as well as violates the sinuses below it? Aesthesioblastoma. Aesthesioblastoma. Very aesthetic sounding. <laughs> what else? How many aesthesioblastomas have you seen outside of a book? None. None. Zero. But yet it's the first thing that comes to mind. Brilliant. <laughs> what else could it be that you've probably seen? Squamous. Squamous cell carcinomas from the sinus can do this. Don't forget meningiomas in this location can be quite aggressive and can enhance because they do undergo malignant degeneration. And because you have sinonasal epithelium, you could have sinonasal uh, carcinomas. Metastases can do anything anywhere, especially in the orbits and in the uh, frontal bone. Don't forget lymphoma. Lymphoma can be quite aggressive once it violates the uh, uh, epidural space. So huge list, and you're, you're favoring what? Esthesioblastoma. Esthesioblastoma, or as we now like to call it, olfactory neuroblastomas. It's the entity formerly known as Prince. Excellent. Who's next? Ah, restant in the front over there? Doris? We, we'll come right back to you. Yeah. No, no, we have to come back, back to you. Okay, go ahead, Doris. Uh, this is a nuclear medicine scan. This is a nuclear medicine scan, and she is sighing. Uh, is what kind of nuclear medicine scan? Uh, this is probably... In probably? In our institution, we use I-123 to visualize the... Wait, 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 time out. If it's not your institution, what other body part could this be? Well, this is a thyroid. Excellent. I Excellent. Medicine agents Excellent. What agent would you use, Doris? I use one tw I-123 mostly. How much? Uh, ah. Ah. I think it's like eight military. I don't remember. Eight millicuries? I Clearly don't remember. It's between 100 and 125 microcuries, but you could use 150 microcuries. You don't want to give them a diagnostic dose if you're doing a, a therapeutic dose if you're doing a diagnostic study. What, what are we looking at? Uh, there's homogeneous uptake in the thyroid gland. So there are no discrete focal areas of either relatively increased or decreased uptake. Um, relatively speaking, do you think this is normal uptake, globally increased uptake, or globally decreased uptake? It's hard to say because you need a window with making it Excellent. Hot, hot or not hot at all. Excellent. It's, is, is 
Homogeneous is your term of choice. What other information could we give you, perhaps, a number? We can check a four hour and 24 hour uptake. Let me give you a 24 hour uptake. The 24 hour uptake is 85%. Uh, is the patient uh, by blood chemistry hyper or high profile? I don't have the blood chemistry. All I have is that number. Okay. It's a hyperactive thyroid gland using the uptake and the scan itself. And how could you, Doris, as a graduating radiologist, treat this patient? Ablate this patient. You would ablate this patient, or preferably just ablate the thyroid gland. <laughs> how would you ablate this gland? What kind of dosage would you use? I would ablate the patient. Yes, and how would you ablate this patient? Well, she, you are a violent woman, Doris. So much aggression, too much rap music, Doris. <laughs> How much, how much um, of a dose would you use? Of I would use I-131, and I would, um, like you said yesterday, there is no limit anymore, but I use about 30. You use about 30. I like you, Doris. I like the agreement. 30 milliculars blasted off because it's toxic and it's grave disease. It's fantastic. Who's next? Well, actually, there was this one person back here who we don't want to ignore. Here you go. Okay. So we have a coronal and axial CT non-con through the paranasal sinuses. Excellent. There's a large expansile mass centered within the right maxillary sinus. We see a displacement of the uh, septum to the left. There's actually preservation of the uh, bone within the maxillary sinus along the infraorbital rim and along the lateral and inferior maxillary sinus walls, which suggests... Um, a less aggressive lesion. Um, I think the age of the patient would help. This does 35. look like 35. Differential for a mass expansile center with the right maxillary sinus would include lymphoma. Excellent. These so we've got something that's, that's expansile, but it's not lytic, so it's not biologically aggressive. So we're on this side of malignancy. So yeah, I think just th this would be uncommon for a squamous cell, given the age. You couldn't exclude it, but it would be less common. You could have an inverting papilloma. Excellent. Um, and that's what this turned out to be. And remember, an inverting papilloma behaves in a malignant fashion, but it's not histologically malignant. Once removed, they have a tendency to recur. Um, who's next? Thank you. Group of smiling people here, you've got to be residents. Okay. Whenever you're free, we have all afternoon. All right. Always take 10 seconds to review the images. 10 seconds to review the images is a good idea. Or you could say crap like MR or T1 weighted or axial. Right. Use the time so they know what you're thinking. All right, so it's T1 coronal and axial MRI. Excellent. Brain. Excellent. Uh, we're looking at a... Uh, we're a really uh, there's, at a mass, there's, there's a mass within the... Uh, basically, it looks yeah, within the uh, turbinates there and extend, you know, basically involving the... Mm, very challenging indeed. I mean, you can't really tell. You know, once things explode in your face, it's a little late to do cosmetic stuff. Well, so you don't know where, where it started. Is it sinonasal right. or nasal sinus? Right. Uh, so what is your differential? Um, differential is going to be uh, squamous cell, uh, carcinoma, um, lymphoma would be a possibility. I mean, there's some areas that look like uh, they're... They're, they could be fluid, so, you know, like necrotic process. I mean, it could be a very aggressive infection. Absolutely. So uh, very challenging to say once you have violated fascial planes. As you can see, this is sinonasal, but then some obstructive sinus inflammatory changes with stasis of secretions, but then it's infiltrated the base of the brain. It's infiltrated the masticator space and the infratemporal fossa as well. So while this might very well be a very aggressive infection or inflammation in the immune compromised, 
as you correctly pointed out, one of the first things you've got to think of is some kind of uh, aggressive sinonasal neoplasm. And this turned out to be nasopharyngeal adenocarcinoma. Obviously, no way you can make the histological diagnosis, but your approach is very good. Terrific. Who's next? So we have uh, axial CT through the mandible and bone windows and an axial MR, which I think it's maybe like a T1 fat sat. You think it's maybe like a T1? I mean, <laughs> like? It could be like a tumor. Are we from California? <laughs> It's like a little aggressive, whatever. <laughs> so this is T1-weighted with contrast because the sinonasal and buccopharyngeal mucosa is enhancing, correct? I, I agree. Excellent. It is so nice of you to agree with me. <laughs> so we have a mass. Excellent. We have a mass. That is arising from the mandible. Excellent. So we have a problem. Yes. Um, it looks expansile. It is expansive. It doesn't just look expansive. It has a, an osseous matrix. It has an internal osseous matrix that is mandible base. And then more peripherally, what's happening here? It's enhancing. Excellent. So a lot of vascular enhancement at its periphery and an internal osseous base, and that's all non-mobile protons. So that's hard, non-diffusible calcium. And as you correctly said, it is from the mandible, so of ossific um, origin. So what is your differential? I would consider an osteosarcoma. Of the mandible? Yes. Excellent. And this is an osteogenic sarcoma of the mandible. Remember, if it looks like an osteogenic sarcoma anywhere, it's going to be an osteogenic sarcoma. Simple things, common things are common. Terrific. Next. Okay. Okay, we have a nuclear medicine study. Excellent. Too many dots means nuclear medicine. This looks like a high energy study given the uh, ugliness of the scan. So I think it's an I-131. You think or you're sure? It's okay to be unsure. I'm, We're here to help. I'm pretty sure it's an I-131 Pretty sure study. it's not good enough. You've got to be there or don't know. This is an I-131 study. Excellent confidence. This is an I-131 study. It's a high-energy study because of the artifact of septal penetration. You see the star artifact. This is a whole body scan, so it involves only a few limited compounds that are whole body images. What are the typical whole body images that you are familiar with? Uh, bone scans. Uh, On a bone scan, you're going to see kidney uptake and bladder uptake, and you're seeing some kidney and bladder activity, but you typically see the marrow of the axial and appendicular skeleton, and you're not seeing that. Plus, it's only 140 kV, so this can't really be a bone scan. What else are the whole body scans that you're familiar with? Gallium scans. Gallium typically has very low signal-to-noise ratio, uh, you see the nasopharynx lighting up. You are seeing that in this location. You do see salivary gland uptake, but you see significant bowel activity. You're seeing a little bit of bowel activity. You don't see any liver or spleen, which you typically do see in gallium scans. So another one, but that's down again. And I like how you're thinking of bringing up all of your whole body images and eliminating them one by one. Next. Um, an I-131 MIBG. An I-131 MIBG scan, which is rarely done, but were we to do it, I guess it could look something like this, but not with such intense uptake. You're going to see more kidney activity and excretion to the bladder. What else? Octreotide. An octreotide scan, you're going to see more kidney activity because that's where it's metabolized. You see liver, kidneys, ureters, and bladder. You don't see any salivary or nasopharyngeal activity. What else? PET scan. A PET scan. Could this be a PET scan? Nothing's rotating? Probably not. No, no seriously. <laughs> if it's a PET scan, mm -hmm. you see brilliant activity in the base of the brain, in the cerebral cortex. You see the, the myocardial activity because of the left ventricular uptake. You see kidney activity. You see significant colonic activity unless they've had a cleansing enema. You see activity in the kidneys and the bladder. You do not see significant uh, activity in the um, colon 
like this. You typically see it only at the, in the distal colon. Uh, it, again, and most importantly, it's not a rotating image. Next. Indium 111. An Indium 111 scan. Uh, typically, you're not going to see any activity in the salivary glands. You should never see any significant activity in the kidneys, ureters, or bladder. Indium 111 scans typically have uh, the highest activity in the spleen, sometimes in the marrow space, and any foci of infection. Uh, the signal to noise ratio is quite low. This one's quite bright. Next. The sulfur colloid. A sulfur colloid scan typically is done for the entire body only when you're looking for marrow packing disorders. Currently, MRI would be a better study of choice. You do a sulfur colloid scan typically looking at uh, RE systems, so either the chest and abdomen or chest, abdomen, and pelvis. Typically, limit yourself to the liver and spleen only. You're not seeing either the liver or the spleen, so probably not an RE cell scan. I can't think of any more total body total body, an I-131 metastatic survey. So once you've done ablative therapy, you give I-131 and look for any uptake of residual uh, thyroid parenchyma. So you've got significant residual activity in the thyroid gland as well as bilateral uh, papillary carcinoma metastasis. So this is a recurrent thyroid carcinoma. Terrific. I really liked how you analyzed all the whole body scans. A, a warm hand, a round of applause for it. It's a very, very difficult case. Okay, here we go. These are two images. One is a sagittal of the neck, and the other one is an axial of the neck. These are MR images. The sagittal image is what kind of sequence? It looks like a T1 varied image. Why does it look like a T1? Are it you is sure? A T, is it, a, it is a T1 varied image. Excellent, because you can see bone, the marrow, mm -hmm. and you can see the fat is bright. You can see muscle. And the next signal. one looks uh, like a uh, post gadolinium axial uh, T1 image. Excellent. And there is an enhancing mass to the right of the air column. It seems to have. Uh, uh, it seems to have a nice thick rim and a central enhancing uh, area. But it doesn't seem to have. It does have, doesn't it? It does have it. Yeah. And na did, did you call it a nasty margin? What, what kind of margin was it? A thick, a thick enhan margin. Thick enhancing rim. Okay, thick enhancing rim over there. And centrally, it's got very heterogeneous. It's a central heterogeneous, which probably represents necrosis. Or liquefactive change. Or liquefactive change. Hard to tell, hard to tell. And uh, it's in the neck, it's on the one side of the neck, and I'm thinking of... Uh, Which side? Can we give it a name? Left, right? It's on the right, right Excellent. side of the neck. Excellent. And I'm thinking of either a necrotic uh, metastatic lymph node, or it could be even, uh, could be like a lymphoma, but it should not have so much of necrosis. But remember, lymphoma and TB can do anything. Yes. So we never say it's not lymphoma. It could, could be. Could it be lymphoma? It could be lymphoma. Oh, you bet it could be lymphoma. It so always lymphoma. say lymphoma. Uh, it could be lymphoma, it could be a nec uh, necrotic metastatic lymph node. Absolutely, because uh, you've got chains of lymph nodes. And infective, uh, any infective pathology also like uh, TB as we said. Always, tuberculosis can do anything. And uh, Now why would I bother giving you the sagittal image? Because torture? It's extension. It's extension and, and it's longitudinal. It's longitudinal extension. Remember whenever you see longitudinal processes in the parapharyngeal regions, uh -huh. You've got to think of what kind of anatomic structures that, lung, uh, that run longitudinally. Mm -hmm. uh, it's the st I can see the sternocleidomastoid mastoid is pro pushed laterally. Right, it's displaced it's posterolaterally. It's displaced lat posterolaterally. And uh, the other thing that, can, that lives there is a brinkel cleft cyst, but it, could it be an infective uh, brinkel cleft cyst? It's possible, but it's too, it's too solid and too, uh, it has too much it's of It's just not a component. cyst. Yes. It doesn't look like a cyst. It doesn't look like a cyst. And th those are typically round. They're not longitudinal. What runs longitudinally in your body? Something big and red? It's the vessels. Vessels, so blood vessels. So this could be really an angiosarcoma, angiosarcoma. rising from the carotid sheath, or a carotid be, sheath tumor. It, it could also be uh, an, for abscess collection running along the carotid sheath. But less Have you likely. seen abscesses in the carotid uh, sheath? Less likely. No. Less likely, yeah. What else? Longitudinal structures, uh, arteries, neuro, veins, and nerves. It nerves, be excellent. Neurofibroma or schwannoma. Don't forget nerve sheath complex tumors. So that's why longitudinal structures, artery, vein, and nerve. Terrific. The so two axial images of uh, CT through the neck at the level of the mandible. You see a cystic mass uh, posterior to the uh, right side midline right side of the mandible body. Um, it is oval in shape, well circumscribed, homogeneously low. This is a uh, non-infused CT scan. So not sure if this enhances, but uh, this is very classic appearance of a renula.
And what is the ranula? It is actually a cystic dilatation of the sublingual duct. Uh, sometimes it could be obstructed or it could be a congenital abnormality, and there are two kinds, whether they're plunging through the myohyoid or not, and I can't really see whether it's plunging because or not. Because you probably need additional images and or yeah. a coronal image. Excellent. Or also known as a mucus escape cyst. We have a, uh, this is a MIBI scan, parathyroid, you know, usually done. How did you know it was a MIBI scan? Gestalt. But, Gestalt. You know, basically, well, basically looking at it, I mean, it could be an iodine based, you know, like an I-123 scan because you have, you know, salivary gland activity, you have activity in the right. region and kind of thyroid Right, and why would blood, there the be stomach. iodine uptake in the left ventricle? Probably not. Yeah. The, Excellent. Right. Excellent. I mean, classic. So... So on, what do you see on this MIBI scan? Well, often we do, well, basically on this MIBI scan, just evaluating the image on the left, there's two uh, foci of increased radio tracer uptake in the uh, region of the thyroid bed, which would be compatible with two uh, parathyroid adenomas. What dose of MIBI would you inject? Mm. Mm. I'd have to consult my charts, but... Um, on the, on the order of two millicuries? Two would be nice and homeopathic. 20 would be better and typical. Right on. So whenever you're doing a whole body scan, go with 20, 25. Those are the safer doses because this is not just one organ. You want to analyze the entire mediastinum. And these are delayed images because you can see that heart activity isn't as bright. Early heart imaging, you're going to see much more significant left ventricular activity. And we've got time for one last case. And here we have a technologist who has put a beakly spot, which means look here and don't look anywhere else. What do you see near the beakly spot? Well, these are uh, we have two axial CT images of the neck. Excellent. Post contrast. How much contrast do you give? Uh, between 100 to 150 cc's. So if this is a one-day-old, eight-pound baby, you'll give it 100 cc's. No. Um, uh, I'm not sure. Okay, it's one cc a pound. Okay. Go ahead. What do you see? Let's just look at the Beakley spot. Well, there's a there's a hypodense mass, which is either uh, an ovoid hypodense mass with a septation through it, or two adjacent hypodense masses. Well, I'll tell you because I've got all the images. They're all a process. Okay. So it's just a corrugated process and, and no real internal septations, but good observation. Okay. Where is this located? It's located anterior and to the left of the thyroid cartilage. Excellent. In and the, remember, this is heterogeneous because of variable ossification and chondrification. This does not in any way mean that this cartilage has been eroded or destroyed. What is this thing? The hyoid bone. Yeah, it looks like a little shield over there. And what has this process done to the... It looks like it has eroded the hyoid uh, bone. Excellent. It has incorporated itself into the hyoid bone. And, and what are these, these muscles around here called? They look like little belt straps. The strap muscles? The strap muscles. Excellent, because they look like little belt straps. So you've got this process which is perihyoid and infrahyoid, off midline, Clearly palpable, liquid in nature. So differential. You should have none. Okay. Well, how about a uh, thyroglossal duct cyst? What is a thyroglossal duct cyst? It's a. Uh, it's a remnant of the. Well, the thyroid descends from the foramen cecum at the base of the tongue, and you can have. Uh, um, it can arrest in its descent anywhere along that path. Right. So it's on its way to where it should be, and on the way it gets arrested, it stops there, hangs out, secretes some fluid, forms a cystic remnant, no significant functioning thyroid tissue, and that's called a thyroglossal duct cyst. Uh, we just saw this, so I'm not going to show it again. Again, normal-sized globe. This is the abnormal globe because it has brighter vitreous, and that's a retinoblastoma. Remember, the retinoblastoma itself is very small. This is the reaction that has occurred in response to it and around it. And uh, one last case, and we'll give this to you. This is a very, very interesting case. It's very near and dear to me. Okay, <laughs> so we have uh, T1 sagittal, T2 axial, and coronal T1 
images of the brain with uh, that's actually a coronal flare but flare I, I okay um, little it, volume loss in this brain prominent subarachnoid spaces but where is the pathology so the pathology is in the region of the pineal Excellent. gland and we have a fluid signal round abnormality uh, which what could this be a pineal cyst. And, and what is this associated with? Hmm. Um, I'm not sure. Anybody? They're, they're quite incidental and they don't need surgery. This is actually a picture of my brain when we were calibrating our new magnet last week. And, and I've got a huge pineal cyst and clearly it's affecting how I work. Um, <laughs> It's just an incidental finding, no clinical significance whatsoever in, in other people, and it's just a developmental remnant, no clinical findings whatsoever. Uh, thank you very much. I'm from uh, Northwestern, as Ed said, and this is the answer to the most frequently asked question in OB ultrasound. <laughs> Actually, I'm just looking here for where the, here it is, the laser pointer. And when we have this question, it's obviously easier and we're more definitive when it's a boy. And I like to say to the parents when it's a girl or when I think it's a girl, that absence of proof is not proof of absence. So we're a lot more certain when it's a boy. I'd like to start by reminding both myself and you that we are talking about people, not you know, a fetus or an embryo. We're talking about someone that's going to grow up and be a person and perhaps take care of us. So we're going to divide up the talk into what is OB ultrasound, how is OB ultrasound performed, and then the bulk of the talk will be on why we do OB ultrasound. We'll divide that up into a brief discussion about dates, bleeding and pain, amniocentesis, and then probably more than half of the talk will be on anomalies. Then we'll end up with a discussion of size, fetal demise, and the biophysical profile, which you'll also be called upon to do. So what is OB ultrasound? Well, obviously it's a study of the fetus, the uterus, and the ovary if it's early enough in pregnancy. It might also be an answer to the question of, is she pregnant? In which case, we really ought to use the blood beta HCG level, which is now more or less universally available. In the past, the urine test was much more available. I don't think it's a good idea to hang your hat on the results of the urine test. I think if it's worth doing, it's worth doing the blood beta HCG. In the past, there was some discussion about OB ultrasound exam level, and we used to talk about a level one exam which I somewhat facetiously would say means don't quote me, and that's basically someone who wants to bill for a study but just wants to answer the question of is there a pregnancy. A level two exam is one that meets the ACR or ACOG standards, and that's what we'll address here, and that's what's listed in your handout. And a level three exam is one we won't really address here, but that's one that's done at a tertiary care center to answer a specific question for a subtle anomaly. So we're going to concentrate on what would meet the ACR standards. How is OB ultrasound performed? Well, nowadays we have three techniques. We can use transvaginal ultrasound, and that's routine now. It's not something out of the ordinary. We can do transabdominal ultrasound, and that's what the bulk of the OB ultrasound is done with. And we can do translabial ultrasound in special circumstances, and I'll show you an example in why we would do that. And we should always use the ACR guidelines and as I said, those are in the handout, and they will be referenced later in the talk. So here's a transabdominal ultrasound. We know it's transabdominal because we can see mom's full bladder. Can we turn the lights down a little bit more? I'm sorry. And then we can see the uterus. And in the uterus, we see a fluid collection. And obviously the question is, young woman in the ER with pelvic pain, childbearing age, positive pregnancy test, and we want to know, does she have an ectopic? And on this transabdominal ultrasound, the answer is, we don't know. 
So nowadays we would use transvaginal ultrasound routinely. The reason for that is the transvaginal probe can be a higher frequency probe. It doesn't have to go through mom's pelvis. It's up closer. And using the higher frequency, it can see smaller structures earlier so we can make the diagnosis sooner. So in that same case, same patient, same day, on the transvaginal image, which we know it's transvaginal because we don't see the bladder, we can see the intrauterine fluid collection has a yolk sac. So we know that there is an intrauterine pregnancy. And in the handout, we discuss the statistics for a simultaneous intrauterine and ectopic pregnancy, and the standard written board's answer is 1 in 30,000 is the frequency where they can both be present simultaneously. But basically, once you've seen an intrauterine pregnancy, the odds that it's also an ectopic are very, very small, and they'll be treated as though they have an intrauterine pregnancy. This is a translabial ultrasound, and this was given to me by Dr. Grant, who lectured earlier in the week on CT for trauma. And you can see here's vagina, and here's cervix, and here's cervical canal, and here's a posterior placenta, and we have a case here of placenta previa. The placenta is covering the internal os, and that's why we do translabial ultrasound. It can exquisitely answer the question, is there a placenta previa when you can't tell with transabdominal ultrasound? The levels and layers are myometrium, decidua parietalis, and then we have the uterine cavity where we could have a second fluid collection, which would make the so-called double decidual sac sign of early pregnancy. And then we have the decidua capsularis, the gestational sac, and the decidua basalis. So the clinical significance of this slide is the correlation with the next image, which is a transvaginal image of the so-called double decidual sac sign. And people have said that if you see this intrauterine fluid collection and you see a second small crescentic one that's probably actually in the uterine cavity, that you could say that there was an early intrauterine pregnancy. I don't think that's a good idea. I think you ought to wait till you see a yolk sac, a fetal pole, or a heartbeat. There are plenty of times when you can make a mistake using the double decidual sac sign, but if the board examiner wants to talk about it, that's what it looks like. The ACR standard for first trimester ultrasound, you want to make sure you find the location of the gestational sac. You want to document the presence of fetal life, fetal number, crown rump length, and then you want to evaluate the uterus and adnexa because later in pregnancy you may not be able to evaluate the ovaries. So this may be your only chance. In the second and third trimester, the ACR says that you need to demonstrate fetal life, number, and presentation. You want to examine amniotic fluid volume, identify the location of the placenta and its relationship to the internal os. You want to examine gestational age by using BPD, biparietal diameter, femur length, and abdominal circumference. You always want to compare to the earliest ultrasound of that pregnancy, and you want to compare the weight and abdominal circumference and the growth. You want to evaluate the uterus and the adnexa if you can. And then the structural survey is actually quite limited. You need to look at the cerebral ventricles, the spine, the stomach, the bladder, the umbilical cord insertion, the kidneys, and a four-chamber view of the heart. It doesn't say anything about demonstrating five fingers or five toes. It doesn't even say two hands. So the requirements to meet a level two ACR standard are really not that demanding. Why do we do OB ultrasound? Well, we're going to examine dating, bleeding and pain, amniocentesis, and then as I said, we'll spend the bulk of our time on anomalies. We'll look at size, fetal demise, and the biophysical profile. This is a critical concept. The gestational age is conception plus two weeks. We date from the first day of the last menstrual period, and that's a day that most of the time the woman knows. This is critically important. If you're only going to take away three slides from this talk, this is one of the three. The earliest ultrasound sets the age. Do not 
change the gestational age based on a later ultrasound. When you do a later ultrasound, you answer the question large for dates or small for dates or appropriate for dates, but you don't reset the clock. If you do, you could end up in court, and I've seen it, and it's happened before, and it will happen again. So please, don't change the gestational age. Crown romp length. Useful from 7 to 12 weeks. Accuracy, plus or minus 3 to 5 days. It's our most accurate measurement. And that's why we set the gestational age from the earliest ultrasound. As you see, each of the succeeding measurements will get less accurate. Here's an example of crown rump length. You can see the yolk sac and the omphalomesenteric duct feeding the baby. And you can see the electronic cursors measuring the crown rump length. The next slide shows why we don't use the crown rump length after 12 weeks. It's because the baby is flexed. Here's the head, here's the rump. If we measure from the rump to the crown, we won't get an accurate length of the baby. So after 12 weeks, when the baby gets big enough to be flexing, the crown rump length is no longer accurate. BPD, biparietal diameter. Below 20 weeks, the accuracy is plus or minus one week. That's awful good. Between 20 and 30 weeks, the accuracy becomes two to three weeks. And after 30 weeks, the accuracy is plus or minus three to four weeks, which really isn't very helpful. Again, that's why the first measurement is the critical measurement for dating. Here's an example of BPD. You want to measure from the leading edge to the leading edge. So we measure from the leading edge to the leading edge. It's usually at the level of the thalami or the widest dimension of the head on a true transverse image. Femur length. We do it between 12 and 24 weeks. The accuracy is plus or minus one week. After 24 weeks, the accuracy drops to plus or minus two to three weeks. If you're going to measure the femur length, you'd like to try to do it with a linear ray transducer. You'll get a more accurate measurement, and you want to measure the diaphysis. Abdominal diameter. Between 24 and 33 weeks, the accuracy is plus or minus 2 millimeters. I'm sorry, between 24 and 33 weeks, it should be within 2 millimeters of the BPD, the biparietal diameter. And that becomes critically important when we talk about IUGR, and I'll show you an example later on. But abdominal diameter, biparietal diameter, you want them to be almost the same between the 24 and 33 weeks that you're generally doing your second trimester OB ultrasound. Abdominal circumference we use for dating measurements, and between 20 and 30 weeks, the accuracy is plus or minus three weeks. Over 30 weeks, the accuracy is plus or minus four weeks. Here's an example of where we would measure the abdominal circumference. And you can see that it's a transverse image. Here's the stomach, fluid-filled stomach. And here we have a C or U-shaped vascular structure, and we want the edge of the vascular structure to be roughly an equal distance from the abdominal wall. And when it is, we know we have a true transverse image. The next image is a poor abdominal circumference because we can see we're almost at the abdominal wall here, and yet here we have a long distance to go. So this is not a true transverse image, and this would not make for a good abdominal circumference. And that takes us to bleeding and pain. So in the first trimester, we have a differential, and in the second and third trimester, we have a different differential. In the first trimester, we're usually looking for an implantation bleed, which is fairly common. We might be looking for chorioamniotic elevation, a blighted ovum, an abortion, or an ectopic pregnancy, or a mole. Here's an example of an implantation bleed. Transabdominal ultrasound, mom's bladder filled with urine, the uterus, the gestational sac, and we have a crescentic black hypoechoic fluid collection that doesn't belong there, and this is a large implantation bleed. Here's a transvaginal image, and we can see the pregnancy here, and we can see this small crescentic fluid collection. And this one will probably be symptomatic because this implantation bleed is right near the cervix. 
So she would probably be spotting. Choreoamniotic elevation. Here's the baby's head, and we see this membrane, and beneath the membrane is this solid appearing hypoechoic material, and that's blood clot, and that's blood in the choreoamniotic separation. A blighted ovum. These numbers are in the handout, and unfortunately, these are numbers you probably need to know. When you have a gestational sac that's greater than 25 millimeters on transabdominal ultrasound, and you don't see an embryo, then it's a blighted ovum. If you have a gestational sac and it's greater than 20 millimeters on transabdominal ultrasound and you do not see a yolk sac, then it's a blighted ovum. If you have a gestational sac that's greater than roughly 8 millimeters on transvaginal technique and no yolk sac, then it's a blighted ovum. And when we're saying these numbers, we're using mean sac diameter. So we take the height plus the width plus the length and we divide by 3 and that's the mean sac diameter. Here's an example of a blighted ovum. We don't see good surrounding hyperechoic decidual reaction. The fluid collection is somewhat pointed. We don't see a yolk sac. We don't see a fetal pole. When we measure it, it's too large. We should see a yolk sac, so this is a blighted ovum. Here's another case, and we can see the measurement on it. It's measuring 26 millimeters. So we should see a yolk sac, we should see actually an embryo by now, and we don't, so this is a blighted ovum. The current terminology is an anembryonic pregnancy. In my institution, I dictate a blighted ovum, because if I say anembryonic, I get an space embryonic, which of course is the opposite of what I meant to say. Abortion. Threatened abortion. The woman's bleeding and the ass is closed. Inevitable abortion. The woman is bleeding and the ass is open. Incomplete abortion. Bleeding and an open ass and remaining fetal parts. Spontaneous abortion. Bleeding, positive beta HCG, and no intrauterine pregnancy. And finally, a missed abortion, archaic fetal demise. This is an example of an abortion in progress. Transabdominal ultrasound, mom's bladder, baby, uterus, fluid in the cervix, and the cervix is open and dilated. We saw this. We rushed them back to labor and delivery, but the baby was delivered very shortly afterwards and was too small to survive. And that takes us to ectopic pregnancy. The classic history, except that most women with the history are not pregnant, is a young woman of childbearing age in your ER with pain, with vaginal bleeding, and with an adnexal mass. When you have a positive pregnancy test and you do not see an intrauterine pregnancy on ultrasound, there are three possibilities. One, there's an early intruder in pregnancy that's too small to be seen. Two, there's been a recent spontaneous abortion or you have a blighted ovum. Or three, you have an ectopic pregnancy and the fluid collection that you may or may not see in the uterus is a pseudogestational sac. You must remember these three things. Ultrasound findings for ectopic pregnancy. You must see a normal gestational sac in the uterus with transabdominal technique if the blood beta HCG is over 1,800. With transvaginal technique, depending on who you read, it may range between 500 and 1,000. If you see any kind of an adnexal mass, but especially a tubal ring, you have to be suspicious for ectopic pregnancy. The most definitive way to diagnose an ectopic, of course, is if you see a heartbeat or a yolk sac outside of the uterus, and that can be seen in up to 20% of ectopics. 
If you see echogenic ascites, think hemoperitoneum and then think ectopic pregnancy. And it's critically important to remember that a negative ultrasound never rules out ectopic. You may not have seen it, but you haven't proven that it's not there. There's been some discussion in the ultrasound radiology literature regarding Doppler ultrasound and the diagnosis of ectopic pregnancy. There is an overlap in the resistive index of ectopic pregnancy, corpus luteal cyst, pelvic inflammatory disease, and other conditions. So in my opinion, the Doppler doesn't help me because any kind of a mass that I see in the adnexa with an empty uterus is suspicious for ectopic, and the Doppler isn't going to sway me towards ectopic or away from ectopic no matter what the Doppler shows. But if you have the proper examiner in Louisville, you will be wanting to discuss the topic of Doppler. And finally, we'll show an example later on of a corneal ectopic pregnancy. This is an example of a magnified view of a tubal ring. And we can see mom's bladder up here, and we see this hyperechoic mass with a hypoechoic central region, and this was an ectopic pregnancy. Here's another transabdominal ultrasound study of a different patient. And we can see mom's bladder, we can see the uterus, and we can see an ectopic pregnancy posterior to the uterus. So this is a living ectopic pregnancy. It's another transabdominal study, and we can see mom's bladder, and we see the uterus, and in the uterus we saw a heartbeat. But if you look closely out in the adnexa, we saw a second heartbeat. So this was an example of an intrauterine pregnancy with a simultaneous heterotopic ectopic pregnancy. So with a fluid collection in the uterus, you expect to see the yolk sac and everybody should think of their own answer here. There are several answers, all true. <coughs> when the beta HCG is 3,600, when it's about five and a half weeks, and when you get to a mean sac diameter of roughly 8 to 13 on transvaginal technique or 20 on transabdominal technique. If you don't see the yolk sac, then you have to be thinking of either a blighted ovum, an abortion, or an ectopic. And you have to tell the ER that there may be an ectopic. And that takes us to mole. The differential diagnosis for a mole is a fibroid or an incomplete abortion. And this is an example of a mole this is a transvaginal image of the uterus, and we can see a complex, chiefly hyperechoic, solid-appearing mass filling the uterus with multiple cystic spaces. The classic description of a mole is a, quote, cluster of grapes, unquote. But there's a spectrum, and this mostly solid mass is a mole. Now, if you see a mole, what do you expect to see in the ovary? you may see a theca lutean cyst, where the ovary is replaced by multiple cystic structures of varying size and shape. The critical point is that after the mole's been removed, if you do a follow-up ultrasound, what does it mean if the theca lutean cyst is still present? Well, if you've done the ultrasound relatively recently after the mole's been removed, meaning within a month or two, perhaps even three, you could still see the theca lutean cyst. It does not mean that the mole was an invasive mole or a choriocarcinoma. And that's an important thing to be able to tell people because if you tell them that there's a choriocarcinoma because the theca lutean cyst is still there, people are obviously going to go into a panic. Second and third trimester bleeding. The differential is short, 
you're looking for placenta previa or abruption. Here's a transabdominal ultrasound looking for fetal position. And we can see the fetal head, so it's vertex. We can see mom's bladder, vagina, cervix, and there's no placental tissue covering the ass. So this is normal. Another case, transabdominal ultrasound, mom's bladder, the baby's in transverse lie, the placenta's posterior, but it's clearly not covering the os. So again, no evidence for placenta previa. Another case, anterior placenta, and we can see fluid in the canal. This is an example of marginal previa. The placenta is coming down to the ass, but not covering it. So this is an example of marginal previa. So here's another example of placenta previa. You can see the anterior placenta coming down and covering the internal ass, except that this is a classic fooler. Because if you look, mom's bladder is full. So what we need to do is we need to empty her bladder. And this is from Sanders' book. And if you look here, you can see the full bladder. And when you have a full bladder, it can push on the wall of the uterus. And it brings it back so that it opposes the surface of the placenta. And it looks like placenta previa. And this is a classic fooler. When you have mom empty her bladder, the wall of the uterus rebounds away. And you can see now that there is no placenta previa. So when you get a placenta previa, from your tech, and the mom's bladder is full, you need to have her empty the bladder and rescan. This is an MR from my fellowship a number of years ago. People are starting to use MR to look at fetal anomalies, but it doesn't get a lot of use today. But this sagittal image shows you the baby's head and the posterior placenta, and you can see the cervix here and the cervical mucosa, and we are showing that there is no placenta previa and that's what we used it for at that time. At this point, you'd probably do a translabial ultrasound and you could probably get the same answer. When I first started practice, one of my partners was on call and he saw this case at night and the next morning he asked me to look at it and I said, hmm, I see this triangular fluid collection beneath the placenta. I think it's a small abruption. He said, no, I didn't really think so last night. Well, the OB didn't believe him and the patient was symptomatic, so the patient was admitted. And we rescanned the patient about 12 hours later that morning. And we now have a bigger, more complex collection here. And the abruption had kept bleeding, and it was now a bigger abruption. And that's what an abruption can look like. It's supposed to be a blood collection between the placenta and the myometrium. Just keep in mind that even though the lady's pregnant, she doesn't have to have the pregnancy as the cause of her pain. You can have a problem with the ovary, like torsion, a fibroid, a appendix, or a million other problems as the cause of the abdominal or pelvic pain. So a pregnant patient, right lower quadrant pain. We did a CT. You can see the placenta's anterior. You can see the baby here. And we look out here. And you can see that the appendix is dilated. And if you look very close or you're up front, you can see that there's some haziness in the fat. Another level, you can see the haziness a little better. This was a case of appendicitis during pregnancy as the cause of the pain. So why do we do LB ultrasound? Well, we looked at dates. We've looked at bleeding and pain. We're going to talk a little bit now about amniocentesis, and then we're going to get to the heart of the talk, anomalies. Amniocentesis. There's two kinds. We can do a genetic amnio or one for lung maturity. When you do an amniocentesis, you want to make sure that you avoid the placenta because of RH or other antibody issues. You want to avoid the baby. You want to avoid the umbilical cord, unless, of course, you were doing an in utero transfusion. You want to avoid the lateral uterine blood vessels. You don't want to cause bleeding that you can't control. And 
In many places, you want to visualize the needle tip. Other places do it somewhat blind after localizing a fluid pocket. If you do localize the needle tip, then this artifact is your friend. And you can see the needle tip, com the needle coming down. And at the tip, there's this sunburst artifact. And the good thing about that artifact is that we know where the needle tip is. The needle isn't going into the plane of the screen, nor is it coming out towards us. The needle tip is in the plane of this image. And that's a good thing to know. This is a different case where we don't see the length of the needle. All we see is the sunburst at the needle tip. And again, we know where the needle tip is, and we know it's not near the baby. So when we talk about fetal anomalies, I tend to break it up into those that affect the whole fetus, such as high drops, and then I break it up on an organ-specific basis, dealing with the head, the spine, the chest, the abdomen, kidneys, and then we'll talk a little bit about dwarf. Before we look at the anomalies, though, we ought to talk briefly about the radio study. This came out a few years ago. It has been a topic of conversation and you should be aware at least a little bit about its problems. The findings from the radio study were that screening OB ultrasound did not improve outcome. Detection rate in Europe was greater than in tertiary care centers in the U.S., which was greater than in a community hospital here in the U.S. But it did not represent the entire population because 68% of the cases were excluded, it did not include the cost of care for a baby with the anomalies. And the indications for an OB ultrasound include gestational age, mom's age, prior anomaly, metabolic abnormality, drugs, bleeding, pain, and perhaps even peace of mind. And there's a whole list in the ACR standard. But if the examiner wants to talk to about the radio study, keep in mind that if he's examining you in ultrasound, he probably believes in OB ultrasound and your main discussion would center on the problems with the radio study rather than supporting the radio study. When we talk about hydrops, we talk about immune and non-immune hydrops. In immune hydrops, we're talking about RH and other antibodies. Non-immune hydrops, and originally non-immune hydrops was less than 20% of the cases. Now it's around 90% of the cases, and that's because we've gotten so good at treating RH incompatibility. But non-immune causes of high drops include cardiovascular problems, infection, Down syndrome, Turner syndrome, cystic hygroma, and those are the things you're going to look for. Here's an image of the fetal head, and we can see this scalp edema. We shouldn't see this hypoechoic space between the edge of the skin and the, and the uh, edge of the skull. So this is scalp edema, abnormal. Here's another case. You can see the head, the skull is here. The scalp is here. There's a lot of scalp edema. It's going down into the neck. Here's an image of the fetal chest. Here are the ribs. And we can see chest wall edema. It's going down into the abdomen, so there's abdominal wall edema. This black hypoechoic anechoic fluid is Plural effusion, that's always abnormal. So this is what hydrops is. Basically, it's fluid everywhere. Transverse image, we can see the heart. We can see a pericardial effusion. We can see a pleural effusion. Again, abnormal fluid where it doesn't belong. But the big picture is that there's too much fluid here. And that's what you're looking for when you make the diagnosis of high drops. There's too much fluid in the uterus. There's too much fluid where it doesn't belong in the baby. And that's the definition of high drops. Here's an example of why high drops might occur. This is a transverse image of the neck. You can see the bony structures here. And we have a loculated cystic mass involving the posterior soft tissues of the neck. semi-sagittal image. We can see that same membrane. So this is a cystic hygroma as the cause.
That takes us to a discussion of the head. We'll look at hydrocephalus, holoprosencephaly, hydrancephaly, encephalocele, anencephaly. We'll look at a choroid plexus cyst, dandy walker, and then we'll have a little discussion about cleft palate. This is a blown up magnified image, transverse image of the fetal head, lateral wall of the lateral ventricle, medial wall of the lateral ventricle, and here's the choroid hanging down in the lateral ventricle, and there's a gap here. It's not opposing the lateral wall of the lateral ventricle. And if we measured this space, it's probably greater than one centimeter. And that's the definition of hydrocephalus. Here's another example, different patient. And clearly, the choroid is not in a horizontal orientation. It is dangling or hanging down. And that measurement with the electronic cursors was 16.8 millimeters, which is way too large. And this is an example of hydrocephalus. Different patient, different condition. Transverse image of the fetal head. Everybody should look and try to think of what it is on their own. It's at the level of the thalami. And we see sort of a U-shaped monoventricle, fused thalami. This is holoprosencephaly. This looks like hydrancephaly. It actually isn't, because if you look down here, there's a little cortical mantle, little cerebral mantle. So this is actually a higher level of the same case of holoprosencephaly, but this is what hydrancephaly would look similar to. have to throw in a few CT images. This is actually, again, from Malincrat, and it's an older image, obviously. But if you look, you'll see the head, and we see a solid mass coming out of the head posteriorly, protruding from the head. So this is a large encephalocele, and obviously this would have a poor prognosis. This is a coronal image. Usually what happens is the tech comes into you and says, I'm having a real hard time getting a BPD. Well, the answer is you really can't get a BPD. And the reason you can't get a BPD is that it's anencephaly, and there's nothing above the facial bones. So here's the orbit, here's the orbit, here's the nose, here's the chin, chin, nose, orbit, and then there's nothing above the orbits. So you can't get a BPD. There is no parietal bone. Transverse image of the fetal head. And this is a choroid plexus cyst. We see the hyperechoic choroid, and we see an anechoic cyst within the choroid. There is a small but statistical risk of associated anomaly with a choroid plexus cyst. And I have that in the handout. This is what the choroid plexus is supposed to look like without the cyst. And we see that they're both hyperechoic and solid. So if you see a small cystic area within the choroid, it's abnormal, and that's a choroid plexus cyst. Transverse image of the fetal head. Look at the posterior fossa. And there's a triangular cystic collection or mass. Sagittal image. Anterior, posterior, superior, inferior. And again, we see a triangular cystic structure. Coronal image. Superior, inferior, here's the neck. And here in the posterior fossa is this triangular cystic structure. So this is a dandy walker cyst. There's a differential diagnosis. It could be mega cisterna magna. It could be an arachnoid cyst. But it's fairly central. We don't see much mass effect. And this is a dandy walker cyst. This is a 3D image of the fetal face. 
and although we don't do it all the time, it can be done out in the community hospital as well. And we can see here the eye, the eye, the nose, and we can see that the upper lip is intact. So there is no cleft palate. Different patient. You can see the eye, the eye, the nose. You can see the mouth. You can see the lips. And I think that this is a good likeness of the baby. And it really makes the point that we're really dealing with a person. We can also colorize these to make mom and dad perhaps get more of a feeling that there's a flesh tone there. And again, no evidence for a cleft palate. We don't actually need the fancy 3D images to make a diagnosis of cleft palate. All we really need are the coronal 2D images, which is an example here. So here's the top of the skull, here's the eye, here's the eye, here's the nose, and then here's this triangular hypoechoic to anechoic area, and that's a cleft palate. When we examine the spine, we're looking generally for a neural tube defect because that's the more common problem. We might also see a solid mass, and I'll show you an example and we'll discuss that later, but we're really looking for a neural tube defect. We need to do a systematic search. We need to use both a coronal image and a transverse image. We do not want a sagittal image, and I'll show you why in a moment. We're looking at the head even though we're looking at the spine, because a lemon-shaped skull, which I'll show you, has a statistical relationship with a spinal defect, particularly before 24 weeks. We also want to look at the cisterna magna and the lateral ventricle, because if those measurements are normal, there's a greater than 95% chance that there is no spinal defect. So we want to look at the head when we look at the spine. Here's a coronal image. The head's up here. So this is the C-spine going into the thoracic spine. And it's a nice parallel double line, normal. Transverse image of the cervical spine. And we don't see the cystic mass involving the posterior soft tissues of the neck like we did with the cystic hygroma. Again, normal. We want to look in coronal and transverse planes. Here's a sagittal image of the lower spine, and this is what we used to call the flip and taper. So we come down thoracic, lumbar, sacral, and we get this sort of upward flip and taper. And that used to make us feel confident and good that everything was fine. But it isn't, and it doesn't really prove much, and this is the reason why. This is a transverse image of the lumbosacral spine. And we see the innominate bone on one side, and we see the innominate bone on the other side, and we see three ossification centers making an equilateral triangle. One anterior and one, two, posterior. The problem with a sagittal image is that you get the anterior ossification and one of the posterior. So you go in this plane or this plane. The problem is, when you have a spinal defect, you get widening in this plane. Okay, so the only way you're going to know that for sure is you're going to want a transverse image like this, or a coronal image, or both. So here's a coronal image of the lumbosacral spine, the innominates out here. The spine comes down and symmetrically tapers, and that is quite reassuring. Here's another case. There's something wrong here. And this is a frightening one because it was a very experienced tech, much more experienced than I had. But it was Friday afternoon. It was the end of the day. It was the last patient. And I looked at this and I said, you know, this just doesn't look right. Let's go back in and rescan. And you can imagine the enthusiasm with which that was greeted. But we went back in, because I was paranoid, and when we rotated, we saw this. 
So this was a myelomeningus seal, and that's why on the coronal image it didn't line up. You know, it doesn't really line up. There's a step here. This should line up here, and this is coming in too abruptly. So that's a spinal defect, and that's what you're looking for. Here's a transverse image. Baby's bladder, a posterior ossification center, the anterior ossification center, and here's the other posterior ossification center. This is not an equilateral triangle. This is a myelomeningocele. Here's another case, different patient. Transverse image, baby's bladder, posterior ossification center, anterior ossification center, posterior ossification center. This looks a lot more like an equilateral triangle, but it isn't. There's too much widening here. And we can see this multiloculated cystic mass extending posteriorly. So this is another myelomeningocele. So when we look at the spine, we're usually looking for a cystic mass at the bottom of the spine. And that's what we have here, a myelomeningocele. And this coronal image is obviously distorted and abnormal. But, as I said earlier, we could also see a solid mass. So this is a solid mass at the bottom of the spine. And in general, that's going to be a sacrococcygeal teratoma. So not only do you have to look for what you expect to see, the cystic mass, you have to recognize the solid mass. Transverse image of the baby's head, abnormal shape. This is the lemon-shaped skull. This is anterior, this is posterior, and we see concavity bilaterally, anteriorly. It should be convex. It should be bowing outward. Instead, it's bowing inward. This is the lemon-shaped skull. If you see this, you must look very carefully at the spine because there's a good chance that there's a spinal defect that you may or may not have seen. This is a very early spinal defect, the earliest I've ever seen. We can see here this cystic mass, and this pregnancy was aborted. Remember when I said we look at the spine, we look not only at the shape of the skull, but we also look at the cisterna magna. We want to make sure it's normal in size. We also want to make sure that we don't have hydrocephalus. We want to make sure that the lateral ventricle is normal in size. Well, this is a measurement of the cisterna magna. The question is, where do you measure it? Do you measure it at the X or at the plus? You measure it at the X. When you measure it at the X in the midline, how big should it be? Between 2 and 11 millimeters. Less than 2, you start thinking about a Chiari. Greater than 11 or greater than 10, that's an easier rule of thumb, you start thinking about Dandy Walker. This one was normal. When you measure the lateral ventricle, you're measuring from the medial wall to the lateral wall. And again, it should be one centimeter or less. And if it's normal, and if the cisterna magna is normal, then there's a very good chance that there isn't a spinal defect. But of course, you still have to look because there's still a statistical chance that there will be a spinal defect. But if the head is normal, you can feel somewhat reassured. Increased alpha fetoprotein, there's a whole slew of causes. Number one on the list is abnormal dates, but you can also have twins, the baby could be dead, and of course the classic that we're looking for when we talk about fetal anomalies is an abdominal wall defect, which we'll discuss shortly. You could have a cystic hygroma, GI obstruction, kidney problem or a placental issue. This was actually four at once, and I tried to get all four in one image, but I could only get three. One pregnancy, second, third, and take my word for it, there was a fourth in here. The AFP will be abnormal if you're expecting a singleton pregnancy. We're going to discuss cystic adenomatoid malformation, 
We saw an example of pleural effusion before, but we'll see it again. We're going to look at congenital diaphragmatic hernia, and then we'll look at some cardiac anomalies. Coronal image of a pregnancy, this is the bladder, and we see this hyperechoic solid mass in the chest displacing the heart. This is cystic adenomatoid malformation. Although the name is cystic, the usual appearance on ultrasound is a hyperechoic solid mass because there are so many very, very tiny cysts. This is a transverse image, same patient, and we can see this hyperechoic mass. And the reason that this can be a killer is if it doesn't leave enough space for enough normal lung to develop so that the baby will be able to breathe after delivery. This is a CT of a baby with cystic adenomatoid malformation after delivery, and they were lucky. They only had a small area, and you can see that here. Multiple cystic spaces abnormal within the lung. Different baby, we can see that's the chest, these are the ribs, and we can see bilateral pleural effusions around the mediastinum. Abnormal pleural effusions. Transverse image, we see a pleural effusion in both costophrenic angles, just like on a chest x-ray. Again, pleural effusion, abnormal. Congenital diaphragmatic hernia. The key clue is that you don't see the stomach when you try to get the abdominal circumference that includes the that should have the stomach. You're looking for a cystic structure that's next to the heart on a four-chamber view. Here's an example. Transverse image, here's the heart. This should not be there. There shouldn't be another cystic structure at the same level if it's a transverse image. This is the stomach that's up in the chest. So this is a congenital diaphragmatic hernia. When we look at the heart, we should not only get the four-chamber view, but at the same time, we want to make sure that the heart and the stomach are on the same side of the body, and preferably that they're both on the left side of the body. So you want to make sure that either you or your tech or both are checking that. And you want to see if the heart rate is normal or if the rhythm is relatively regular. And we get an M-mode tracing to give us a calculation of the heart rate. Transverse image of the fetal chest, there's an anomaly. Look at the heart, and as we look in this ventricle, there's a hyperechoic solid mass. So the first thing we want to ask is, which ventricle is it? Well, it's the ventricle closest to the chest wall. Which one is that? That's the right ventricle. So we have a hyperechoic mass in the right ventricle, probably a moderator band. Another transverse image of a different baby of the level of the chest. Here's a ventricle, here's the other ventricle, and there's a hyperechoic mass. This time it's the ventricle away from the chest wall, so it's in the left ventricle. What's the most common hyperechoic mass in the left ventricle? It's probably a papillary muscle. Here's another four-chamber view of the chest, but it's abnormal. This is rather uncommon. The heart is protruding through the chest wall. Here's the chest wall. We expect it to continue on here, but the heart is going through that imaginary line. It's protruding through the chest wall. So this is an example of ectopia cordis. Here's one head. Here's another head. And unfortunately, there's only one chest. Another image of the same thing. One head, the other head, one chest, and one heart. So this is an example of Siamese twins, but unfortunately there's only one heart. So when we look at the abdominal wall, 
we tend to look for two things. We're tending to look for the omphalocele, which is a case where the umbilical cord inserts on the defect in the abdominal wall. The defect tends to be in the midline, and it is associated with other anomalies. Or we're looking for gastroschisis, in which case there's a normal umbilical cord insertion site. The abdominal wall defect tends to be on the right, and there's a low risk of associated anomalies. This is an example of the normal umbilical cord insertion site. We can see the umbilical cord inserting into the anterior abdominal wall, and there is no associated defect. Here we can see cord, and in the cord we can see liver and even some bowel. So this is an example of omphalocele. There's a defect, and abdominal contents are herniating into the cord, into the defect. Now here's another case, and this looks almost like gastroschisis. If I had cropped it a little tighter and gotten rid of this membrane, it would have looked like gastroschisis, and that's what gastroschisis looks like. But with the membrane, this is another example of omphalocele, where there's an anterior wall defect, and abdominal contents are herniating into this membrane-covered space that the cord will insert on. The normal umbilical cord is a three-vessel cord, and there's a large vessel, which is the vein, one vein, and then there are two smaller vessels that are the umbilical arteries, and we expect to see three vessels every time. And it's quite reassuring to get this transverse image of the cord showing the three vessels. Now here's another case of the umbilical cord, but I only count two vessels. Here's one big one, that's the vein, and here's one small one, and that's the artery. So a two-vessel umbilical cord is associated with congenital anomalies, and I've got that in the handout, but it's a relatively easy thing to see if you examine the cord. Renal anomalies. A longitudinal image of the fetal kidney, and it's clearly abnormal. And we can see that there's dilatation of the calyces and collecting system, and the calyces are linking together. And in an adult, we would call that hydrocephalus, I'm sorry, hydronephrosis. And that's exactly what we call it in utero. So this is an abnormal in utero renal ultrasound showing hydro. Usually it's not that obvious. And what we do is we take a transverse image of the abdomen and we look at the fetal kidneys and we measure the AP dimension of the renal collecting system if we can see it. It used to be said that if the AP dimension of the collecting system on a transverse image was greater than one centimeter, it was abnormal and that we should be looking for hydronephrosis. In the current edition of Callan's book, we now say between four millimeters and 10 millimeters, it's perhaps uncertain. And that under four, it's clearly physiological, and greater than 10, it's clearly abnormal. And perhaps between four and 10, we should look again. So we're being more specific, or rather, we're being more sensitive, but we're being less specific. So at this point, if you measure a dimension greater than four millimeters, you should certainly mention it in your report. This is an abnormal fetal kidney. It's been replaced by multiple cysts of varying size and shape. So this is multi-cystic dysplastic kidney. When we look at the kidneys, a lot of times we don't really see the kidneys. We see the renal beds or the renal area. And in fact, in the ACR standard, it doesn't actually say you see the kidneys, it says the renal region. But what's quite reassuring is if you can see fluid in the bladder. Because if you can see fluid in the baby's bladder, it means that at least one of the baby's kidneys is working. So not only is that something that you need to see just to show that the bladder's there, but it's quite reassuring for the kidney function when you see a fluid-filled bladder. This is a magnified view of an abnormal bladder. 
So here's the bladder filled with urine, and that's why it's black or anechoic. But it's got this extra sort of protuberance from the bladder. It, if you can remember sort of masterpiece theater and the old locks, it has a, quote, keyhole, unquote, shape. And if you look very carefully, you can see that there's perhaps a dilated ureter coming up from the bladder. So the keyhole bladder, especially in this case because we know it's a male fetus, suggests bladder outlet obstruction. And in a male fetus, we might be thinking of an in utero diagnosis of posterior urethral valves. This is two images that I've put together on one slide. And we have a coronal image here of the abdomen and pelvis, and here's the kidney, and we can see that there's marked hydronephrosis. We can see this serpiginous tubular anechoic structure, and that's hydroureter. And then we can see this transverse image in the pelvis where we can see the bladder. So obviously the question is, why do we have this hydronephrosis and hydroureter? And if you look very carefully, you can see that there is a small hyperechoic membrane. And what we've got here is an in utero diagnosis of a ureteroceal. Now, one of my first slides was the answer to the most commonly asked question in OB ultrasound. And this is the same thing, except slightly abnormal. And what we see here is the scrotum, so we know it's a male fetus. And we see one, two, or bilateral hydrocele's. Now we'll talk briefly about dwarf. This is a linear array ultrasound image of the fetal limb in utero, and it's abnormal. And the reason it's abnormal is it's an in utero demonstration of a fracture. And when we see an in utero demonstration of a fracture, we start thinking of causes. And this would be an example of osteogenesis imperfecta as diagnosed on OB ultrasound. Now, when the baby came out, this is one of the radiographs of the baby, and you can see multiple fractures with healing. And again, this would be suggestive of osteogenesis imperfecta, and I'm sure this will be covered in the pediatric lectures. When we talk about fetal size, we're generally saying that either the baby is large for dates or small for dates, and of the two, Large for dates is more common and less important, and small for dates is less common but much more important. Now, the only way you could make the determination of small for dates or large for dates is, of course, to compare it to the earliest ultrasound from the pregnancy, and that we discussed when we were discussing dating measurements. When we just say large for dates, we're usually discussing polyhydramnios. When a patient has polyhydramnios, 60% of the cases are idiopathic. 20% are due to maternal causes like diabetes or RH incompatibility. 20% are due to fetal CNS problems or GI obstruction or perhaps cystic hygroma. You could also be large for dates because you have twins. You could also be large for dates because the baby is large, macrosomia. And this is what you get the ultrasound for to distinguish among these possibilities. This would be another example of polyhydramnios. The baby is just swimming in fluid. There's too much fluid for this gestational age. This would be an alternative explanation for large for dates. This is twins. And we can see the electronic cursors are on one head, and next to it is the second baby. And this is twins as an explanation for large for dates. When we talk about small for dates, the most common cause is wrong dates. 
Maybe the mom isn't sure of when her last menstrual period was. Maybe there wasn't any early ultrasound in the pregnancy. But the explanation for small for dates that worries us is oligohydramnios. The definition of oligohydramnios is an amniotic fluid index of under 5, and the definition for polyhydramnios is an amniotic fluid index greater than 24. Causes of oligohydramnios include the pneumonic drip, demise, renal, IUGR, premature rupture of membranes, post-dates, illness, and perhaps mom wasn't getting enough food, maybe mom was old or too young, maybe she was taking alcohol or smoking during the pregnancy. There are multiple reasons. When we calculate the amniotic fluid index, it's a four-quadrant summation of the height or depth of the amniotic fluid. So we add the depth in the left upper quadrant, the left lower quadrant, the right upper quadrant, and the right lower quadrant. We add those together, not including the baby, and we get a number. And in this case, it was 143 millimeters, or 14.3, and that's our amniotic fluid index. Here's an image from an OB ultrasound, and it's difficult to evaluate the structures of the baby. And there's a reason. The reason is that there's too little amniotic fluid, and this is an example of oligohydramnios. Without the fluid surrounding the baby, it's very difficult to see the structures. So this makes a very nice unknown. These are two images placed side by side, same pregnancy, same date. The image on the left, transverse image of the abdomen, and we can see fluid in the stomach. The image on the right is a transverse image of the fetal head. Now, why would someone put a transverse image of the abdomen and the head on the same picture? It's because they want you to compare the size. So the abdominal diameter here looks smaller than the BPD. So what do you think when there's a disparity between the abdominal diameter and the BPD? Well, that takes us to a discussion of intrauterine growth retardation. Symmetric IUGR, meaning head and body are relatively similar in size, but smaller than they need to be, suggests that there are fetal problems in the pregnancy, maybe a cardiovascular problem or a trisomy or maybe a viral infection. Asymmetric IUGR, like we just saw on the previous slide, suggest a ureteral placental insufficiency, which suggests a problem with the mother, like diabetes, hypertension, SLE, renal problem, or perhaps a placental issue. When we do Doppler for IUGR, we're looking for decreased or reversed diastolic flow. Unfortunately, Doppler doesn't make an early diagnosis of IUGR it tends to make a late diagnosis. When we look at umbilical artery Doppler, we're looking for an elevated AB, or systolic to diastolic, ratio. A rule of thumb, a rough rule of thumb, is that the ratio of systolic to diastolic flow in the umbilical artery greater than three after 30 weeks is associated with IUGR. So greater than three, 30 weeks. Unfortunately, this has a sensitivity of under 50%, and I have a chart 
in your handout that actually shows you the, rate, the actual ratio at given ages of the pregnancy to make the diagnosis of IUGR. But as a rule of thumb, 3 and 30 is a good one to keep in mind. And what really proves that there's IUGR on Doppler is if the diastolic flow is decreased, but a reversed diastolic flow is ominous. So here is a Doppler tracing, and we can see that the peak systolic velocity is 95 centimeters per second. The end diastolic is 41.2 centimeters per second. And we can do the math in our head, and we know that that ratio is close to 2. So it's not greater than 3. We can see that there's a good diastolic component to the waveform. So this is a normal umbilical artery wave tracing. Here's another patient, umbilical artery Doppler. And we can see that the systolic to diastolic ratio is 3.56. Okay, so that's greater than 3. We might compare it to the actual chart, but by our rule of thumb, this is abnormal, and we should be starting to think about perhaps IUGR. Here's a different patient, and this is clearly an abnormal tracing because we see little or no diastolic flow. The only thing worse than this would be if the diastolic flow was going below the baseline, which would be reversal of flow. Transverse image of the fetal head, abnormal. There is a mnemonic. This is called Spalding sign. What we see here is overlapping of the bones of the skull, and this is an old sign of fetal demise. Nowadays, obviously, we wouldn't see any cardiac activity. We wouldn't see any spontaneous fetal body motion, and that would be how we would make the diagnosis. We wouldn't be looking for Spalding sign, but this is a classic old term that was actually from X-ray findings to make the diagnosis of fetal demise. And this is a very old case showing overlapping of the bones of the skull for Spalding sign as a sign of fetal demise. The biophysical profile. This is taken out of Callan's book, and when we do the biophysical profile, we have a worksheet where we try to document all of these. And if you get these in the baby, then you give it a score of two. If you miss on any one of these, for that category, you give it a score of zero, and you're hoping for a score of 10 out of 10 since there's five things that you're looking for. So we're looking for a breathing episode for 30 seconds during the 30-minute exam. We're looking for fetal body movement. We'd like three general movements during the 30-minute exam. We want to see an episode of fetal tone, an episode of flexion and extension of a limb. We want to see the amniotic fluid volume at, at least one centimeter in two perpendicular planes. And we want to see two episodes of acceleration of fetal heart rate of 15 beats per minute with each episode lasting 15 seconds duration associated with fetal movement. And that's all in your handout. This would be an example of the fetal tone. This would be a clenched fist. And you can see the thumb here. And you can count one, two, three, four fingers. So we have five fingers, and this is good. So this is a clenched fist. And then a few moments later, the fist opens, and that's good. And that's what we're looking for. So that's OB ultrasound, the lectures.